All right, listen, let's get started. I want, I'm very excited about this message today. And, um, uh, you know, we sing that old song in your bulletin. I, I mentioned it, you know, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me, thank you, and he bought me with his redeeming blood. Some of you don't remember it. He loved me ere I knew him. Now all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flow. Everybody, no, I'm only kidding. Never mind. <laughs> Everybody sing. Listen, we sing that. We talk about victory in Jesus. We, we claim it all the time. And yet so many of us walk around like we just heard the worst news in the world. We have our heads hung low. We can't find hope or joy in our daily life. We're tired out, burnt out, all the outs. We're like just a mess. And we go, where is the joy? You know what? The joy is in the victory. But if you're not experiencing victory... You're not going to have much joy. So if you would please, would you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm going to start, um, I'm going to start at verse 51. Now this passage is often used uh, for funerals. <laughs> And if you're not experiencing victory in God, <laughs> we take it for what it's worth. You know what I'm saying? Because if you're not experiencing the joy and the victory of living this wonderful Christian life that Jesus died on the cross for, it could be very much like a funeral. So I think it's apropos. Just kidding. Come on. Verse 51. Behold, look, he says, I tell you a minute, a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable ha have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, and it's from Isaiah, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you open our hearts, Lord, that we would rise up this morning, Lord, and understand in our hearts, O oh God, that victory that you wrought on Calvary. Um, amen. I, I want to just share with you a couple of things on this, uh, on this message this morning from the very beginning. This, the beginning of this passage talks about death, the physical death, you know. But it also, there's a spiritual truth in this. So many of us claim to be Christians, but, but we have not put on immortality. We don't think with, with uh, the Lord's mind. We don't think uh, or consider with God's heart in our lives. So we're not putting on immortality. We're not putting on imperishability. We are still chained to the old world way of thinking. We are still trying to figure out stuff with this gray matter instead of the spirit of Almighty God. When we got saved, that's why I love that song that we sang. You know, normally our, our uh, gathering song is very upbeat. Wahoo, yeah, yeah. But this, that song really spoke to me this week. It says, and then I got saved. Saved from what? 
saved from death in all aspects of our life. We are now born anew. We are now, we have crossed into another realm and we have put on immortality. Listen, we don't have to worry about this, this flesh, this stinking flesh, this, this shell that we have. For we have already crossed over. When we accepted Christ and He took us in, we have been sealed with His blood. I'm telling you, if that don't give you joy, you are in the wrong place. It gives us joy to think that Almighty God died on the cross for me so that I could be born again, be made new, that my past is no longer holding me back, that those things that I, that I used to be insecure about, those things that I failed every day in, those things that people judged me on have no effect on me. There is great joy in that freedom. I want to ask you today, are you experiencing that? And if you're not, listen, I understand because for me, uh, the grace grows step by step, line upon line, precept on precept. I know that I'm not the best I'm going to be next week. Wait till you see me next week. I'll even be better. But I'm better than I was last week. Because as I submit myself day to day, over and over again, that grace abounds in my life. The more I come and, and, and submit myself to Almighty God, God's grace becomes overpowering in my life. And my motivations change. And I'm not doing it for what people think about me. I'm not doing it for what people talk about me about. I'm doing it unto the glory of God. And if they don't like it, that's eh, okay. God loves me. This I know. Amen? Amen. Listen, I want to just say a few things. If you're going through some of that difficulty that I'm talking about, where you feel that, you know, just, just not, you know, getting very much ahead in the things of God, I want to just remind you of a few things to keep in your heart this week. Who is your king? Who do you serve? Who do you really serve? You know, uh, Bob Dylan wrote a song, you're going to have to serve somebody when he was a Christian <laughs> for like 30 seconds, I guess. But <laughs> until he found out that he, that he was serving the wrong guy. <laughs> he said, you might serve the devil or it might be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. So this morning, I, my question to you is and not that, that uh, you have to answer to me, but in your own heart, who do you serve? Who is your king this morning? Is it your boss at work? Are it the people that you hang out with? Is it, is it someone who uh, has great authority in your life? Is it your husband? Is it your wife or your kids? Who is your king? It's vital to, to come to that point where you acknowledge that. If God is your king, if Christ is your master, if the Holy Spirit directs us, then you're on the right track. But if there are others trying to take that spot, if there are other people, other situations, if your own pride, if your own selfishness, if your own uh, uh, preoccupation with you is taking that place, you're trying to serve two masters, and that can never be. So in this life, as we seek to serve our God, we come under and we submit ourselves to Almighty God, we come unto the Lord and we acknowledge that He is God, pretty soon that burden that controls us has to go. There's no room in our heart for two kings, only one. It's not our country, it's not our president, it's certainly not our governor. We're going to have to come to the conclusion... Who is your king? It's not you, by the way. It's not you. If you're a Christian, you serve a mighty God. You serve a God that is all-powerful, everywhere, and yet came low to die on the cross that we would be with him. So when you settle that, and, and you know, you can always tell if it's settled. Because if you get angry with somebody who points out that you're still proud or you're still this or, or so, how could you be so selfish? And all of a sudden something rises up in you? You haven't been serving your king. That's why it's, that's why it's rising up in you. 
You don't have to protect anything if you're serving the king. If you have the king's seal on your heart, you don't have to worry. You remember when the, uh, when the prodigal comes back and the, and the father says, put a ring on his finger. That was a signet ring. That was a very important point in that story. That signet ring gave indication of who that young man was. Who, who he belonged to. What that signet ring meant was that he belonged to his father. Today I want us to understand that if we are wearing the signet ring of our father, it's an indication for everyone that in our life, we don't care what anybody thinks about us. All of a sudden, people's opinion of us don't matter anymore, or shouldn't, because we belong. We've got the ring, see? We've got the power. One of the things I've learned over and over again, because I've been on the town council now for almost 20 years in Southington, when someone first gets on the town council, they they go about trying to make themselves so huge and walk around with such a big head, it's amazing, they fit through the door, you know? I'm council, they call the police department, I'm councilman, so-and-so. We've got a small town, the police officers all know all the councilmen. They have to introduce themselves as councilmen. Why? Because they're insecure. They want them to know who's calling. You understand what I'm saying? But as a person really takes on the authority that has been given to them, they don't have to prove it anymore. They don't have to prove it. You know, you, it, sometimes you'll hear uh, uh, new preachers talk about, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm a nobody. God found me and all that's fine. But there comes a moment when you're walking in the call and you know it and you don't have to apologize anymore. Listen, I didn't call myself to preach. God called me. Talk to him if you don't want him. You know what I'm saying? And it's the same thing with you. I don't care if you're flipping burgers at McDonald's. If God has called you there, you don't have to apologize. You don't have to rationalize. If you're a college professor, you don't have to uh, 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 try to justify yourself. If God has called you, he has called you with power and the unction for the job that you've been called to do. You stand in his authority, not in our own. You know? Listen, some people... Some people call me Vicky. You know, some people at home, they call me Vicky. And you know what? That's okay. I don't mind them calling me Vicky at all. Sometimes people will come into this church and they'll call me Vicky too. That doesn't bother me one bit. But some of you call me Pastor. That means you acknowledge the gift of God in me and that we have a special relationship. That really touches my heart. But you see, I don't have to walk around with pastor tattooed across my forehead. I don't have to say, hello, I'm pastor. Because pastor is a function. It it, it talks, it's it's a, a relationship that we have. Those of us that are saved by Almighty God, we don't have to carry the big Schofield Bible everywhere we go. Hey, I'm a Christian. (laughs) See this? No, we live the gospel and the, and the epistles are written on our hearts. It's open for everyone to read. Our lives are an open book. So the first thing you have to know is who's your king? Who is giving you that signet ring? And so when you get that, that is the very foundation of victory. Because we can't make one miracle happen. I know there's been people who've tried. And I must admit, early on, I used to really try. You know, my prayers were out loud were, Lord, heal them in the name of Jesus. And inside my prayer was, Lord, if you don't, you know, that, that's going to be a hard thing. And they may not come to me again for prayer. And not anymore. Because I stand because God is doing the work in our lives, no matter what we're called to, no matter what the gifting is, we stand on Almighty God. We give Him the glory and we do His work. We are in His righteousness. Somebody better say amen. We are in His righteousness. There's no righteousness in in me. None at all. But in Him, there's all righteousness. So when I approach a situation, I better approach it as God would have me approach it because I don't know the answer. And I can't fix one thing. Not one thing. 
It is only God that can both will and do in my life. And that's for all of us. You know, uh, one of the things about walking in victory is to, the next step really is to understand that we don't win victory. We come from a place of victory to win the battle. Of victory. We are ready in victory. You know why? Jesus died on the cross. And he rose from the dead. And now we can say, death, where is your sting? Because it's no longer in the hands of the enemy of our soul. It's no longer in the hands of the devil. It's in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our king. He's the one that determines our life. So we walk from, we walk from victory to, to the battle. We're not walking to victory. We're walking from victory. Isn't that cool? We're walking from the cross. We're walking where we laid our life down. We're walking when Jesus accepted us and picked us up and put us on the road. That's why it's important to remember who's running the road for us, who's in charge of us, who's leading us, who's doing the work in our lives, whose righteousness do we have, because we are coming from a position of victory. Why? Because our daddy won the victory. Because our Lord won so, so when we get into those trials and, and those temptations that we read about in James, we are grounded in the word of God. We understand the wiles of the devil, the things that the devil wants to, to usurp in our lives, the, the way he wants to control us. There is no way that he can take our victory. It's our victory. The only way he can take it is if we give it up. And sometimes we get weary and tired of the battle and we end up giving up. But the Lord never said give up. The Lord always said submit it to me. And if we're so tired and weary, maybe we're working on our own. But the battle can be weary. The battle can be tough. But we still understand. You know, there was a, you know, and I have to ask for your forgiveness because I saw this, um, uh, this uh, female uh, preacher, and I, I don't know her name, but boy, I, I was so impressed. She talked about, uh, about understanding the devil. And she said uh, in, this, in this teaching session, she said she went to uh, a fair with, a uh, church fair with uh, her child and they were in line there was a big long line and they had these little they had a a piece of plywood and holes cut out of the plywood and these puppets would come up and then you'd have a nerf hammer you know and you'd whack the the puppet and the puppet would go down underneath you know and all the kids wanted to whack the the animals the the puppets you know so it was a big long line she's standing there with her three-year-old and there's a five-year-old kid standing behind her and he was squirming like crazy why do i have to stand in line i want i don't want to stand in line anymore mom you stand in line I'm going to go play something else and when it's our time I'll come back and he was just going on and on and on and and the adults were kind of laughing and then at one point little Johnny got so frustrated he ran up to the table where these puppets were coming out and there was a skirt all around the table like that and he pulled away the skirt and then underneath the skirt there were two adults underneath with the puppets in their hands doing this right and he goes fake fake See, so many times we don't realize that the devil wants us to believe that he's real, that he has this influence in our life. Oh, I believe he's real. Don't misunderstand me. But he wants us to believe that he can control us, that we have given up uh, our ability to rise above, even in the midst of our most difficult times, even in those times when we feel just out outnumbered and, and uh, uh, so messed up. He wants us to give up. But we know the truth. We know the truth. The devil is, is not eternal. The devil is going to find his end. When he was in heaven, he, he thought of himself to be like God. I will be like God, he says in Isaiah. Isaiah tells the whole story, his fall from, from grace. He, he knows that. But he's still playing the facade. The devil is a liar. The devil is the accuser. The devil will will do everything he can to bind us up so we will not follow the will of God. He knows he doesn't have you. See, that's the thing. He just just wants to beat us up. And the more we let him, and the way we let him actually is by getting off away from 
from the fact that God is our Father. We start to look at things. We start to run from this thing and this thing, and then we're doing, spending time here. We're being reactive to situations. We're, we're not taking the time to, to do our devotions. We're not taking the time to spend time in His Word. We're not taking the time to, to fellowship with Almighty God. And then we're like, oh man, this is the roughest day of my life. Oh man, you know? You know? You know, and Batman was hit and go, pow, you know. Yeah, it's me, this, oh man, pow, you know. That's what he wants us to feel. He wants us to get off track. He does not have us. If we are a blood-bought child of the king, we know who we believe in. We know we're heaven-bound. We know that nothing in this world is going to keep us back and that God will is victorious and he will bring us to victory, not in one situation or two, but every day, wherever, you know, wherever we place our foot. What did he say to Joshua? I'll be with you like I was with Moses. Every place you put your foot, you're going to take the land for me. And the call is the same. If you're a Christian, the call is the same. Every place you put your foot, you will find victory because God has already ordained it. God has already called us to it. And where you are is exactly where he needs victory. Where you are, you are the light that is shining in the midst of the darkness, wherever you are. 7 in the midst of the darkness... You know, at the hospital, at the schools, at at Ray's office, wherever you are, in the midst of it, there is light and life because of the victory of Jesus on the cross. Because guess what? You bring the victory. You bring the victory. You bring the light. Oh, I'm telling you, it's so important for us to get a handle on this. You know, the scripture says this. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. He gives us the victory. He gets, so turn to your neighbor and say, He gives us the victory. He get, you know what, you know what giving is? It's a gift. Our victory is a gift. It's not something we earned. You know that, right? You can't earn victory like you can't earn salvation. The victory of Jesus is a gift to us. So, so when God says you have the victory, it's because it's a gift for us. It's thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives it to us. What will we do with that victory? You know, are, are we going to bury it somewhere and just walk around like anybody else in the world? Or are we going to walk in the victory that Jesus gave us at Calvary? The thing that is so wonderful that, that we could say, listen, I'm born again. I've got this victory. I once was lost. I once was an alcoholic. I once uh, did drugs. I once beat my wife and kicked the dog. I did all of that stuff. But now, but now I'm a new creature. Those things are not in my life anymore. Why? Because the victory that I received when I accepted Christ is at work in my life. So when that old hymn goes, Victory in Jesus, you know, we, we you know, us old timers, we sang that song, Victory in Jesus. It wasn't written like that. When that song was written, everybody in the house would be standing on their feet, clapping and shouting and raising their hand. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his unfailing love. You understand the difference? we got to get excited about this thing because we're bringing the light. And if we're not excited, that light is covered by doubt, fear, our own pride. It's covered. The, the cause of Christ is given to us to walk in that victory. Are there battles? Oh, you better believe it. Are there ba- Church, are there battles? But there is victory as Jesus leads us, as Jesus brings us forward, as he continues to watch over us and gives us the victory. 
I, I wrote down some, just a few other notes. Uh, victory, the meaning of victory. If you go back to the Greek, I should put Pastor Bob on, on the spot, but I'll, I'll just tell you what I picked. I'm not, I'm not a Greek scholar like Pastor Bob is, but it means to utterly vanquish. Victory means that what was there before is vanquished. It's gone. It's no more. It's no more. The victories that we've had in this life are over things that are no more in our life. No more. The, we came from a dark place. Some of us came from a dark... Is that true? I know I came from a very dark place. You know? Nobody knew how dark it was. I knew. But no more. I'm not in the dark anymore. I'm with Jesus and because of that relationship with him, because of your relationship with Jesus, every place you go, you bring the light. Every place you go, you bring peace. Every place you go, you bring understanding and, and righteousness in an unrighteous world. You know? I, it's amazing to me that so many of us get off track. We begin to... And it's a, I believe it's the, it's the hand of the enemy. We get off arguing about small little facts in the scriptures. You know, post-trib, pre-trib, uh, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to be with Jesus no matter when the trib is. The other thing is we, we nitpick one another. You know, oh, they are this or they're that or, or this. Let's stop worrying about each other and start focusing on the unsaved, the people that Jesus wants to, you know, you're going to stand before the Lord. Are we going to say, well, I would have done better. I would have saved more. But, uh, you know, that church down the street, they didn't believe like me. And, and I got really mad at them. Stop it. That's the hand of the devil to bring dissension in the, in the, in the family of Christ. Listen, leave it to the Lord. I'm not telling us to, to, to deny our beliefs. All I'm saying is stop bickering. Don't let the devil lead you into that kind of nonsense. That's all it is, is a bunch of nonsense. If you're not speaking truth in love, and that, and that truth in love, the, 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 litmus, the litmus test of that is, is, are you bringing somebody closer to Christ? That's it. But if you get so much joy out of putting them in their place or nailing them to the wall, I just, na- I, somebody's told me, I just nail them to the wall, Pastor. I told them. I told them. Yeah, what did you tell them? And tell me more about how many people you're going to bring to the God. See, we think we've got to, sh- that's, that's from a point of pride. That's a point of self righteousness. You check yourself. I know I have to. I have to. I mean, I'm preaching it, but you know, I'm talking, you guys know me. I'm t- preaching to myself. When we start to correct somebody, are we, are we doing it for restoration? Are we looking to restore somebody? Is that really our heart, or do we want to correct them? Listen, don't let the devil get you off track. Don't be wasting, you know, when the, when the, when the, uh, uh, a hurricane happened in Houston. I'm telling you, I, every, I, there were like three different people that came to me. Two of them were pastors and had joy, literally joy in telling me, oh, Joel Osteen, boy, he's getting his. You know, that he wouldn't open up his church. Who has time to worry about that? Why should we worry about that? We are, prayer should have been for the victims and the people. Stop getting into all of that. That's how the devil diffuses us. And we start worrying about other people instead of looking unto God for our own direction. I know, I'm coming down hard. I don't mean to be. But I want us to be real about where we are. I want us to recognize that when we think we're so self-righteous and we're going we're gonna to tell everybody what they're doing wrong, that doesn't do anything. You're just you're dancing to the devil to bring dissension and, and, and separation in the body of Christ. I want you to understand that victory comes with that spirit of reconciliation. Not that we agree to sin. Not that we go on and on about uh, 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 things that are not of God. But I want to tell you that we continue in the truth that is in Christ Jesus. This morning, I just pray that as we go forward, that we, this week, that we will have that in our heart. 
that the love of Christ that draws us, the grace that draws us, sustains us. And that grace that we have received, we need to bring it out to the world. That will draw people into the Lord. That great grace. They'll begin to listen to us because we don't have a critical spirit. We have a loving spirit. We don't have a judgmental kind of thing going on, but rather that we're opening so that we're open so that they can come in and hear the good news and get the victory we received. That's what it's all about, church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Do you believe it this morning? Well, a couple anyway. That's always good. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Somebody has to stand for righteousness. And it's not our own righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ that has drawn us together. Our life is in the Lord.